have to tell you one of my favorite video series to do on this channel is where Mr. Millennial Mike spends his time going through the comments, pulls out the good ones, the spicy ones, and allows me to kind of react to them. Uh, this is a lot of fun. I never know what the questions are going to be. Uh, so, Mike, thank you for doing this. A lot of fun. I, I, I'm still amazed that you're willing to do this for us. So thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Happy to do so, you know, and we also get a lot of video suggestions from people. So they DM me or they DM you a video they want reacted to. And we do that in the next segment. But to start out, yes, we're going to go over some different topics. So we've got, you know, people talking about your recent changed your mind on the housing market video. How's a recession going to impact us? The leverage boys, which I kind of like that nickname that I heard. We're now referred to as the leverage boys instead of the crash bros. So, uh, why don't we get started with uh, changing your mind on the housing market? So uh, at Jill Pettick, 1003, she says, would you agree that if a market average is negative or even 2 to 3% that no deal is worth it for anything less than 5% as you can make 5% near risk-free in other ways? Yeah, if you're, if you're referring to this with just this one caveat, this, this is not owner-occupied, this is not house hacking, this is not one of those answers just straight up investment absolutely right uh, i i fully support that if the risk free rate of return is 5% and your average in your buy box is 3 you're probably not doing a deal right unless you find an out you know an outstanding deal at 8 or 9 yeah i would not do i mean i can be very clear about a year ago i would do a 6.5% yield i won't do anything less than an 8 today for much of that reason. So I think she is onto something and I would agree with it just with the caveats of house hacking and owner occupied. Cause those you have different variables there, but as a straight up investment. Yeah. The risk free rate of returns 5%. So I, I'm not doing that to break even, right? And what do I mean by break even if the building produces 5% and I can go get 5% in the treasury, um, being a landlord is not worth zero. So, uh, yeah, she's on to something. <laughs> well, how do you factor in, uh, you know, obviously there's more than just what the cash flow is. I mean, there's benefits like depreciation, the tax benefits. I mean, where, where's your break even point with some of those other factors and even appreciation on the asset that you're not counting in your cash flow return? I don't include any of them. I don't include depreciation. Don't include mortgage pay down. Don't include appreciation. I understand it all happens, but I want to know how hard my cash is working. I don't want to beat up my spreadsheet. And I certainly don't want to include appreciation assumptions um, in my equation. Do they happen? Absolutely. Am I, am I a millionaire because of it? Absolutely. But doesn't go in my deal spreadsheet. Never has, never will. So don't talk yourself into something just because you're so gung-ho about real estate. Make sure that it is only a great deal you are doing. Correct. All right. I like it. Okay, cool. Um, so how does a recession impact flipping at Gilbert Fleming asks, what does a recession do for the price of and the cost of flipping houses? So this is a really interesting question, especially where we are in this economy. And I'm going to, I'm going to highlight again, something I talk a lot about, and that's above and below the median, because I think it matters today. Uh, I wouldn't touch a flip above the median. Certainly luxury, 2x the median, I wouldn't touch it. No chance. Right. But if we look below the median, it's it's a hot market. So what does a recession do? So a recession brings down commodity prices. And if you were in this game, you know, two years ago, lumber was crazy. It's now cheap. Recession will also probably meaningfully impact labor. One of the things, again, because I'm in this business a lot, it was really hard to get people call you back. Mm -hmm. And I know these people. I've given lots of these people hundreds of thousands of dollars over 20 years, and they were even hard getting back to me. I am starting to see people say, hey, Michael, you got any projects coming up next month? I have a little hole in my schedule. So that's interesting. Something else that often happens in a recession is people pull back. Uh, so rents can go up, especially in houses, because mm -hmm. people want houses versus apartments. And then the last thing that probably happens is the government, the powers that be, will create first-time homebuyer programs to incent homeownership. It's kind of their stick. So yeah, I think a recession will create demand below the median. I think it will free up and cheapen labor. 
I think it's already cheapened up supply like materials and probably will do that more. And then lastly, a recession will scare people. And the people that do the work will find it easier, not easy, just easier to find good or great deals. So that's what I think happens in a recession. Interesting. Yeah, you know, I have never done a flip or a remodel project during a recession. Obviously, you went through the last recession. Um, I can tell you what it's like to do a flip when interest rates start tanking and that's or start skyrocketing. Excuse me. That's not fun. Certainly feels like just as much pain, I'm sure, as coming up with a uh, a falling value uh, if you were trying to flip above the median. But it's interesting that you talk about how above the median, there's danger and below the median, there doesn't seem to be as much. Because yeah, where I'm purchasing in Indiana, the rentals that I have, there's no drop in prices. Everything's still right where, it, where it's been for the last couple of years, because now there's more people who are forced out of above the median coming down to compete below the median. So things seem to be just exactly the same. Um, okay. okay, the Leverage Boys. I like this nickname. The Leverage Boys are losing. We got a hater. At Gmail2573 says, Leverage Boys, the real estate fools, are getting annihilated as we enter this deflationary spiral. Luckily, they've never had to pay the income taxes like the rest of society does. That should help solve the hurt of the coming losses. Well, I think he kind of made our point for us when it comes to benefits of real estate, but are you getting annihilated right now, Mike? Do you know any real estate investors getting annihilated? Well, there are people in pain, let's be clear. If you were buying Airbnbs in Austin, Texas, you're getting hurt. If you bought for appreciation, you're getting hurt. Um. I mean, you, you LPs, there was, you know, there was a hundred million dollar loss in, in a Houston apartment deal with more coming. There is, we've been warning about stupid behavior and now the pain is coming. Mm -hmm. But if you're someone like myself or you who do the work, understand average, only do great deals, fixed rate debt. I don't know. I don't, I'm not being annihilated. I don't, I don't, I don't know what he or she is talking about. So yeah, I, I, I'm not, I'm not sure what they're, I don't, I, I guess they think property values are falling. I guess. I don't know what they're, I don't know what they're looking at. Cause I, I have no idea. There's just somebody that's cranky probably lives in his mom's basement. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe a stock investor who's just a little jealous of the fact that we don't have to pay any type of uh, income tax on rental income because of wonderful things like depreciation, which you don't have with stock portfolios. So, um, now, here's a good question for you, Mike, kind of to follow up on that. Um, when it, when we talk about, uh, you said Airbnb, Airbnb people suffering, um, I am seeing a little bit more when it comes to the posts out there of investors talking about, oh, we planned on $3,500 a month in rental income. And now we're accepting, hoping for $2,900. We've listed for $2,900, but markets at $2,600. I think a lot of people anticipated that rents were going to continue to grow at the same pace they did, or even just hold steady at where they had gone to, hoping that rents wouldn't come back down. And so I'm seeing some people make posts about that, and I think they're in trouble. I think their properties are going to end up going back to the bank, because if you're taking a $600 alligator a month, it doesn't feel good. No, and again, these are all the things I've warned about. You never buy for you never buy with negative cash flow. It's that's why the no alligator thing exists. Um, you know, I I mean, I still remember it's in my first book. A buddy of mine, like a family friend, two levels above me in the organization, brought me in his office and said, "I'm going to buy four units in New Orleans after Katrina because of some depreciation mumbo jumbo." And I'm like, "Dude, you're going to lose a thousand bucks." He's ah, oh, don't worry, I can afford it. Like, you're you're buying, planning to lose a thousand dollars a month. What are you thinking? And sure enough, things go bad, and you know, suddenly the property values aren't worth the, what they're worth. And he's like, well, that doesn't feel good. He lost them all, right? So, yeah, there be pain. There, again, one rental at a time. Never told anybody to buy. All I want you to do is do the work. I want you to do the work. That's what drives me crazy about the crash bros. It's not that they are negative on housing. I don't give a rat's ass if you're negative on housing. What bugs me is you're telling people to do nothing. That bugs me. Because in any market I've ever seen, there's somebody making money. Mm -hmm. And it's the crash bros that give permission to sheep to do nothing. That pisses me off. Yeah. When, when you and I had our first conversation four and a half, five years ago, one of the things you told me was I needed to learn more about seller financing. 
Um, and just probably a week ago, I locked up a deal under seller financing, which was 10% down at a 4% interest rate um, with 30, full 30 year amortization. And I locked that thing up in May, May 1 of 2023. Terms, you know, 3% better than the interest rate I could get from a bank, half the down payment, still the same amortization. Uh, oh, and I'm purchasing the property about $60,000 under market value. So that doesn't suck. No, it's a freaking good deal. And so the no, point is- No, 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 no. Great deal. Excuse me. It's a great deal. My bad. <laughs> Come on now. My bad. It's a great deal. Um, uh, but the, the, the point I'm trying to make here is, yeah, so the crash bros could have a point. Housing sucks. It hurts. Everybody's feeling the pain. It's hard. It, yeah, it ain't easy. There's these it's great not deals. supposed to be. Between. Yeah, so you, but you got to get out there and look for them. People are like, Mike, how'd you find this seller financing deal? What's the secret? Like the secret is the other thing you told me other than seller finance, which was to network more yes. Dude, I call and talk to everybody. I tell people all the time, join the local Facebook groups, follow the local YouTubers, call all the agents you can find. I found this one on Facebook. And when I first saw the deal, it sucked, but I negotiated it down to where it is at the end. Anyways, Proud of you. Proud thank of you. you. More questions. Okay. So recently you've been releasing the best of one rental at a time with some star studded interviews. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, what I wanted to, what I wanted to ask you going one by one here, cause you released re-released your interviews with David Green, Pace Morby, meet Kevin. Okay. Yep. If you had the chance to interview David Green again today, what's the one question you would want to ask him? Oh, um, David Green. I would want, I think I'd want to talk to him what he sees in the real estate market, the next, the real estate and lending market over the next five years, because I think that will drive. If I understand where a guru sees the future, I can translate to what he's going to talk about. So I think I would ask David Green specifically, what is he envision for, for real estate and lending over the next five years? Rates, availability, uh, things of that nature. That's where I'd probably go with David Green because I'm not sure I have that answer and I'd want to know. Yeah. yeah, I definitely think lending is such a big part of this game that we play that that's one of the main main major concerns for people. Like, when are we going to get be able to get better rates on our money? And for a lot of people, the answer might be, well, we're probably not going to get threes or fours anytime soon. But uh, okay, and then Pace Morby. What's the one question, if you got to do a follow-up interview with Pace, what would you ask him? So one of the things I've seen, because again, this video was Pace was like four years ago when we, he actually whiteboarded a sub two deals. It was a lot of fun. Uh, Pace, again, this is just my opinion. He's pivoted to bigger deals. He's now doing kind of sub two and creative financing on a totally different level. Mm -hmm. So I think I would ask him. Um, I probably got, I'd probably try to separate what's the same and different doing that. And, and I suspect he's going to say it's actually easier. I suspect is that, you know, negotiating a $12 million deal on an apartment's easier than a 200 K house, but I'd, I'd want to clearly understand that I'm going to guess he would tell me it's easier, but that's where I'd probably take that conversation. Yeah, you're probably right because you're dealing with a more educated seller on seller financing. And that's yeah. always the biggest hurdle when you try to proposition that to some homeowner who has it fixed in their mind. No, I want my money right now. I don't care if I got to pay more taxes. I don't care if you'll pay me more down the road. It's tough. Yeah. It's and tough. commercial has assumption fees. Usually commercial loans have a 1% assumption fee. Right. So um, that that's where I would take that conversation. Yeah. Okay. And obviously former gubernatorial gov uh, candidate, meet Kevin. If you had the chance, what would you ask him? When are you running again? Oh, not at all. So again, I think, I think I still would go back to meet Kevin, the 203k loan. Not many people can do what Kevin does, right? His burn rate's 12 grand a day. He's got a private jet. He's got all these things. That's unattainable. Even for guys like you and I, I have no interest in doing that. But if we can go back to meet Kevin when he's 19 years old working at Jamba Juice, and I think it was eight grand or 12 grand or whatever it was, him and his wife before kids buying a 203K loan in Southern California, that's, that's what people need to hear. So I would probably take meet Kevin back to that. It wouldn't be the jet. It wouldn't be the financial advisor because all of those things are cool mm -hmm. and are awesome and probably fun talking one-on-one. -on -one. 
but that's not helpful. Meet Kevin, the 19-year-old 203K loan. That's where I'd probably go again. I'd probably want to hit that again. Maybe he, maybe you could just do the interview on a jet so we could at least get that. Yeah, maybe, yeah. I mean, I mean you did some from the bathtub. Yeah, that was that thing was gigantic. It was, it, was a, it was a pool, man. It was a small pool. Uh, okay, so we talked about the people that you have interviewed, these star-studded, big YouTube personalities. My question for you next is, if you had the opportunity to interview any one individual in the real estate space or in the small business space, whatever, whoever it is, who would you pick and why? I think there's a couple people that I'll throw out here just for good karma. Uh, I talked about her this morning on my daily financial news, Danielle DiMartino Booth, somebody I admire, somebody that I can always appreciate her logic, but I don't always agree. And those are often fun conversations. I think she's wonderful, a great follow. Um, Gary V. So somebody I've looked up to for a long time. He is very much, he wants to build the biggest building versus terror of the people down. Good karma. Uh, I like, I like his message. That would be a lot of fun. Uh, Grant Cardone. I don't know. Again, I've actually put out a video probably two years ago about what I would ask him. And I would ask about early Grant. Grant, mm -hmm. tell me about that first house. Tell me about that first apartment. Tell me about hustling living below your means and saving. I, I'd want to know about Grant then, because again, it's like Kevin. It's a, it's interesting. Grant today, by all accounts, is a billionaire. It's, it's entertainment, but not attainable. Right. So I would take Grant back, and I don't think he wants to go there. And no, it, he shouldn't have to. So I don't know if I'd want to talk to him. Uh, Patrick Bet David would be fun. That'd be cool. Uh, yeah, I think, I think we actually disagree, but I think it could be respectful. Like he talks about housing crashing because he can write 30% off or below on million dollar homes. Well, like Patrick, that's, that's not average for most people. Uh, I think value tainment would be a lot of fun. Um, there's, there's more. Um, who else do I like? Um, Tom Nash, I think is an interesting mm. guy. He's yeah. more of a stock guy. I yeah. like how he thinks. Um, Oh, George Gammon. Mm. I've done some George Gammon reactions. I'd love to ask him about why he sold houses in 2018. That seemed early. Uh, I also want to talk to him about his 10% inflation call, because if you truly believe that, don't you want to own housing? I mean, it right. seems kind of backwards to me. Right. Um, I mean, for a long time, I wanted to interview Robert Kiyosaki, but he's kind of gone wacko to me. <laughs> right? A little bit. <laughs> a little bit. I mean, I want to thank him for Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I've been very clear. It changed my life. But I think there's too much just, I mean, I don't know what's going on there. It just seems way off. Yeah. But yeah, those are, those are you know, some good karma out there. If you guys know any of these people, make an introduction. Yeah, no kidding. Leave comments on their videos. Let them know that they need to come uh, talk to the One Rental at a Time community. Um, okay. And you know what? Speaking of valuetainment, that guy sells insurance. We have a question about insurance. So this one comes from Prane Ethan Panini. I don't know if I said that right, man. I'm sorry. Uh, he says, I've been following this channel for a while now and started investing in rentals. Can you make a video on raising home insurance costs and how we can shop for good home insurance? Yeah. So home insurance is no joke. And again, I've been through a couple of cycles. Um, where home insurance really jumped. I mean, people in Florida, Texas are getting smacked, floodplain smacked. Um, it's it's something you have to account for. Uh, you can go to, bro it's much like mortgages. You got to go to brokerages. Uh, I will tell you, having filed three fire claims, you don't want to go with the cheapest. You don't want to go with bare bones. Um, but yeah, you can shop them around. You don't, you don't have to stay put. But generally... Generally speaking, cheapest isn't always better. Um, and oh, by the way, as a landlord, you generally can raise rents to offset some of that. But yeah, insurance is bad. And just because we're on insurance, I saw a question the other day. I always get umbrella policies. Mm -hmm. Even when I had one house, one rental, we had an umbrella policy. It is extra. It's, it's, it, it is an extra layer of security. So I'll, I'll just add that answer in here. Yeah. Yeah. And there's something that I usually do is I, I usually go for, a higher deductible 
because I'll pay more out of my pocket if it saves me in my monthly cost. That's a way to get cheaper insurance without lowering the quality. You're just acknowledging that you're going to pay more to repair, but that's what you would do anyways. Something you might not know as an investor, you don't want to use your insurance unless it's for the fire. If you're calling them for every little thing, your rates skyrocket or they'll drop you and then you can't get reinsured by anybody else. It's a nightmare. So get those uh, deductibles up higher, pay stuff out of your own pocket, save yourself on your monthly cash flow by having lower Great advice. Great advice. Uh, okay. Uh, let's see here. All right. <clears throat> Growing in the next cycle. So yeah, in your book, you talked about how, you know, you, you sold off that first batch of single family rentals and you started to grow into those smaller apartment buildings. Uh, Juan Diaz, we eight DU says, Hey Mike, I love the video wrap up from Friday, how you were going from 60 units to 200 units. Uh, but how are you going to grow in this next cycle? What's the plan? So a couple of things. I don't necessarily, I don't think I've ever said that I will grow in the next cycle. So let's be clear. I don't have to. It is a luxury that we are at. Um, but I think there's two things that we may do with our portfolio. We actually might upgrade our quality. So we own a lot of C-class single family homes that were bought for very little that have lots of equity. Um, we may 1031 out of those into new construction. That is possible. We are talking about that. Uh, I do believe after my event with Jonathan Twomley about uh, syndications in apartment buildings that the pain will be bigger than I thought and last longer than I thought. So there is absolutely a possibility that we 1031 out of houses into apartments and just rinse and repeat what we did last time. I think there's a very good chance. I think there's a very good chance that Olivia and I buy our biggest building ever in the next two years. And that will be with a 1031. Um, so yeah, we, we will, the, the cycle that's coming, we got ready for it and we told you it was coming. It's here. We're very clearly in the first inning and this might be an extra inning game to steal a baseball analogy. That was a big takeaway from the event in Vegas is the pain that's coming will be bigger than I thought, but last longer than I thought. So initially I thought I had to make my moves in the next 18 to 24 months it might take 36 months to kind of play out. So um, I'm not in a rush, but we will probably upgrade some quality and we will probably get a bigger unit, our biggest jet. That's probably what we're doing in the next cycle, but no promises. We we're, we're good where we are if we, if we choose not to, but that's, that's kind of the answer. Yeah. I was, I was listening to, I think it was the real estate rookie podcast Somebody from Bigger Pockets was interviewing a bunch of commercial lenders and real estate syndicators at a convention. And I'm watching these, you know, 30 second clips of one syndicator after the next talk about how they're pausing disbursements and how they're slowing down growth and how they're having to raise capital. And they just want to make sure they shore up funds and they're changing their strategy and pivoting. I'm like, oh, you can see the pain in their eyes. And they even left a comment saying, you can see the pain in their eyes. Don't invest in these people. Clearly they're in trouble. That comment got deleted so fast. I was like, you got to be kidding me right now. Knocking. <laughs> uh, oh, well, we've only been saying it for a while. Okay. Uh, last question. Uh, this one is from Ryan... Ryan Olep, 1078, how does he do it? He says, I'm now hooked to this channel. After seeing things play out these last two years, this is the only channel that I've seen that accurately predicted the housing madness we've been living in. So Mike, how do you do it, man? Well, thank you for that. I appreciate it. I, I do try really hard. The, the, the answer is I look at it every day. Uh, I have a network of people now because of this channel around the country that I could bounce ideas and questions off uh, both real estate, number one, real estate agents. Uh, I have an editor from fortune, Lance Lambert. I communicate with Logan from housing wire. Um, I'm constantly trying is the only answer. And of course I admit mistakes, but I think it's really important to take shots. I think a lot of people think they know what's going on, but they don't take the shot. They don't create receipts as I call it. And um, I think it's important. And we have been running really good on this channel. I don't know, to use, again, a bet baseball analogy, my batting average, but it's got to be six or 700. We're running pretty good. And the stuff we've missed, we've missed, you know, on scale. We haven't been disastrously wrong like the Crash Bros since 2020. We've been running really good. 
Yeah. And, you know, um, I definitely think that the advice that you get here and I see it just relayed in the comments all the time that it's the non doom and gloom, reliable financial news. Sometimes things suck. Sometimes things aren't going well. You're going to get that breakdown. You're going to get the why you're going to get the what to expect or how to pivot or how to work around it. But it's not going to just be the constant. It sucks. It's never going to get better. Don't do anything. Take no action. Be afraid because that's what generates views. So you can get mm -hmm. honest analysis uh, and then real actionable steps forward through the mess. Like, for instance, as you told me, learn seller financing. And then I'm still able to do good deals in 2023. So, Mike, that was no, it. No, 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 great. no. I was able to do great deals. My bad. <laughs> great deals in 2023. Mike, that's everything I had for you. I'm sorry about that. It was a, it was a slip of the tongue. My bad. I like having fun with you. It's fun. It's fun. Mike, I, again, thank you so much for doing this. I love the questions. Keep it up, folks. Leave comments below. Mike will find them. Send them videos to react to because that's what we're doing next. Thanks again, buddy.